ones and some new ones, uh, that some of which the U.S. has been involved with, other of which other countries have put forward as uh, relating to their own priorities. So uh, I think, as usual, um, the fact of a summit, as Gary mentioned, creates a moment in which countries want to come and say, we've done things. This is meaningful. And this is, and President Obama knew this, uh, and he actually recognized this at the end of the Seoul summit. Gary may recall he seized the microphone uh, impromptu. Um, we hadn't given him a script, and he said, this is why we have summits. It brings people together. It empowers the Sherpas and the Sioux Sherpas to do the work uh, because they know their president cares, and it gets things done. And so I think we'll see more of that uh, when we gather in The Hague at the end of the month. Thank you, Laura. Uh, why don't I go to Samantha now in snowbound Washington? Um, well, Samantha, you have helped uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, develop and implement something called the Nuclear Security Index. So why don't you describe that for us? It's a very challenging uh, uh, you know, methodological question to try to develop a way to measure other countries' nuclear security. But talk a little bit about that, and in particular highlight where you think there are some issues that, um, um, that still pose concerns for nuclear security. Great, and again, thanks for having me. It's exciting to be back there, even though I'm not there physically. Um, I think it's helpful for some of the audience to take a little bit of a step back first to, to talk about why we're actually doing this. Why do we care about this? And we care about it because there's enough material out there to build tens of thousands of nuclear bombs like those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that material is spread through hundreds of sites in 25 countries, and it's not all, all secured properly. Now, we know that terrorists are seeking those materials. They want to build a weapon. The know-how exists for them to build one, and we shouldn't hesitate to think that they will use one. With the consequences that are just unimaginable, hundreds of thousands killed or injured, uh, commerce affected, environmental, public health um, effects. But the good news is there's a solution, and that's to secure the material, because the hardest part for a terrorist is to get their hands on that material. And that's what the summits are about, is getting, again, getting all these leaders together to take seriously this threat, come together, recognize that it requires a global response, and to take specific actions. And so the Obama administration, Gary Laura, received should receive a lot of credit for doing that uh, important step. Now, when we, uh, after the 2010 summit, NTI looked at what was going on. We saw a lot of good progress. Countries were making commitments to take actions to improve their security. But what we were missing was a discussion of a, a set of priorities for what actually matters in securing material. So if there's you know, X many things that a country needs to do, which ones should they do first with limited resources? Um, and there was also no way to really measure progress or hold states accountable. So what we did at NTI, uh, with the advice of an international panel of experts, which Matt Bond served on, was to try to develop a framework to assess countries' nuclear security conditions. And what we hoped to do was promote a dialogue on what matters, on the priorities, measure progress, and then promote action by states individually and collectively to improve their security as a kind of roadmap to uh, what steps they might take. So the index itself, the Nuclear Material Security Index, it assesses nuclear material security conditions across 176 countries globally. And we developed a framework that we thought um, broadly covered the things that matter for countries' security conditions. Um, and without getting into too much detail, because you can get really into the weeds in this, uh, we look broadly at things like how, how much material does a country have and how many sites is it located in, because the more you have, the more locations that the, the materials are located, then the more opportunities for terrorists to steal that material. We also look to the actual security and control measures that countries are requiring their facilities to take to protect the material. We also look at things like uh, has that country signed up to certain treaties or undertaken voluntary actions in support of international efforts. We look at whether they're implementing their international obligations, and we look also at their risk environment, uh, which includes corruption, political stability, which you may not think is directly related to nuclear security, but indeed can have an impact on a country's ability to secure its materials. So the first index came out in January 2012, and the second edition was just released this January. 
And what we found was significant progress over the last two years. And most significantly, seven countries have removed all or most of their weapons usable nuclear material. That's a big deal because that's seven fewer countries from which terrorists can steal material. Two years ago, when we did the first index, there were 32 countries with this material. Now there's 25, and we expect that number to go down. Um, that's just a, a big step for countries to take for security. Other countries are reducing quantities still. Um, they're strengthening their laws and regulations to for more stringent control and security measures, and they're signing and ratifying treaties engaging in some of these other international efforts. Um, and they're also inviting peer reviews, which are um, invitations for international experts, perhaps from the International Atomic Energy Agency and others, to come in and look at their security arrangements and make recommendations, which is a, it's important for countries to do, not only to improve, but it shows others that they're doing what it takes to secure their materials. Um, so we saw a lot of progress. But there also are a lot of challenges. Without going through the long list of challenges and all the recommendations that we have in the report, I thought I would focus on, on one piece of it, which is important and in the context of the summit. And that's the fact that despite this dangerous material, the consequences that material could be stolen and used in a bomb to destroy a city, despite that fact, there is no global system that covers all this material. And for those of you in the audience, you should feel shocked by that um, because of the consequences. And when I say there's no global system, what I mean is there's no international standards or global rules of the road that govern all of this material. That means countries, well, I'm sorry, what they're doing is voluntary. Okay. They're taking different approaches. Some approaches are good, some not so good. In other cases, we don't even know what countries are doing. Sorry, can you Go hear me ahead. okay? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Uh, all right. Um, there's also no international body with any oversight over this stuff. And there's no accountability where countries are, are doing things that would increase the confidence of other countries that they're doing um, what the best thing to secure their materials. So what's, what's very incredible about this is when you look at other industries, like civil aviation, where security is paramount, this actually is not the case. There is a system. There's an international body that sets guidelines for airlines. They audit airlines, and then they share security concerns with other countries. And if an airline is not meeting the standard, they're not going to be allowed to land at an airport. And the reason that there's a system there is because countries have recognized that they have an interest in ensuring the safety and security of their citizens when they fly. Now, we're dealing in nuclear security with some of the world's most dangerous materials. So why is there no system when, when the consequence, it's not a plane crash, it's the, the leveling of a city with a nuclear weapon? So one of the recommendations that came out of our report is that global Oops. leaders at the summit and beyond should come together and discard these notions that aside, you say, don't worry, I have everything under control, that they have a sense instead that it's a shared responsibility and they come together and agree on the principles of a system that would cover all of materials, that would apply international standards and best practices to all material, would have some way for countries to build confidence in other countries that they're securing their material and also continue to reduce their quantities. And this can happen. It's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of political will. But I like to, uh, my, my boss, Sam Nan, he likes to ask two questions, and I think it's relevant for this audience. He says, the day after a catastrophic attack on a city, what would we wish we had done to prevent it? Why not do it now? So I think at the summit, leaders should be asking themselves these questions and doing the necessary things to get to a system which is the only way we're going to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to Matt now, and here's sort of the advertising section of the evening. Uh, the Belfer Center has just put up today a new website on nuclear security, which Matt is going to introduce and talk about. And we Why don't also you, there it is. We yeah. also have some publications that will be coming out uh, that will talk about progress and work that needs to be done. So Samantha, uh, 
you, you know, you've been, tempor you've been temporarily replaced by uh, the website, but I'll ask Matt to talk about areas of progress and areas where more work needs to be done. Matt. So I think Samantha did a nice job summarizing some of the progress that has been made. We have a major report coming out next week, knock on wood, uh, that will summarize some of what was accomplished over the last four years of this accelerated nuclear security effort. And uh, you can see that a lot of work, in fact, did get done. In addition to the seven in the countries that eliminated all their significant quantities of weapons usable material in the last two years that Samantha mentioned, there's another five before in the previous two years. And overall, since 1992, 27 countries have eliminated all of the potential bomb material on their soil. So there's nothing there that terrorists could steal and use in a nuclear bomb anymore. That's dramatic progress. That's really, in a sense, bombs that will never go off. If you look, uh, for example, at all of the places in non-nuclear weapon states where there's enough really high quality material for the simplest kind of terrorist gun type bomb, what you find is that during the four year effort, either that stock was eliminated completely or some significant security upgrades uh, were put in place uh, for those materials. So that's really very significant progress there. You, similarly, if you look at the five nuclear weapon states that are parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, each of them took some significant steps during the course of the past four years to improve uh, nuclear security uh, at their sites. We still have ongoing cooperation, for example, with Pakistan, uh, uh, which is outside the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, to improve security there. But we still have some quite major gaps. Uh, there are still, I, I would argue, very significant weaknesses uh, in Russia. There are huge threats in Pakistan. There are situations where terrorists have you know, taken on Pakistani military headquarters, uh, heavily guarded facilities. Um, in Russia, you have a major corruption problem that also exists in Pakistan, for example, the director and two of the deputy directors of one of Russia's largest plutonium and highly enriched uranium processing facilities were arrested uh, not very long ago for major corruption on a scale of millions of dollars. Uh, we have uh, the overall structure, as Samantha was saying, of uh, the architecture for nuclear security worldwide is still quite weak. We have treaties, we have collective initiatives but they don't have as much oomph as they have in nuclear safety or in civil aviation, as Samantha was saying. I don't want to go on too long, partly because we have this major website here, which really has a lot of detailed information, has links to a large number of uh, different reports, uh, details on particular aspects of nuclear security. I want to highlight two particular products that have already come out and a couple of more that are soon to come. We have up there a detailed briefing on the threat of uh, nuclear terrorism uh, that was the briefing that the Sherpas, the people who helped the leaders prepare for the summit, received at their last meeting uh, before the summit. My colleague, Will Toby, actually uh, delivered the briefing. Uh, we also have uh, a new report just out that's from an unprecedented survey of experts in most of the countries where plutonium and highly enriched uranium exist asking the question, what changes have your countries made uh, and what factors led you to make those changes? And in every country, they said, either we've made our nuclear security rules much more stringent or we've made them somewhat more stringent. Uh, and uh, it was really important to try to understand what kinds of things drive those changes because if we're trying to get countries all over the world to change their nuclear security and make it better, it helps to understand, well, what, what factors is it that cause countries to make those kinds of changes in the first place? Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have a major report coming out shortly uh, on the progress that's been made overall uh, in recent years. We'll have a, a new paper from my colleague Trevor Findlay coming out on the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency. We'll have a major new report coming out on nuclear security in China in particular, written with Chinese uh, colleagues. All of that will be up on the website. Uh, there's quite an amount of commentary as well. Let me, since Samantha is here, at least in spirit, let me also show briefly 
the website for the nuclear security index that she was talking about. So this is a quite detailed website that has a lot of information. In particular, you can zoom in on particular countries and see what were all the ratings for a particular country. Here we see uh, a brief discussion of Russia. And you can zoom in and get the particular ratings for any country that you'd like on, uh, that they got in the, uh, in the NTI index. So that's a, a really useful uh, resource. And you can find links to that at our website, which is Nuclear Security Matters. .belfortcenter.org. Um, and I will leave it there and turn it back to Gary. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Laura, I want to uh, come back to you for uh, one more round before we uh, open it up to the audience. You've heard about all the progress that's been made, and the Obama administration deserves some credit for that. But you've also heard about some of the areas where more work needs to be done. Now, President Obama has announced that he's going to host what will be the last nuclear security summit of his tenure in office in Washington in 2016. Tell us a little bit about what your expectations are, what you'd like to be able to achieve in that last uh, summit of President Obama's term. Well, I think what I'd, one of the things that I hope we can continue to work on is the international consensus around the threat. You, you heard some of the important characterization in, in Samantha's laydown of, of the challenges that we have. And the way I look about it at the, from a nuclear terrorism point of view is that nuclear terrorism is a combination of motivation, capability, and opportunity. And terrorists are clearly going, what, whatever the ups and downs of any various Al-Qaeda, you know, core or periphery or whatever uh, may be, there's always going to be some catastrophic terrorists out there, whatever their motivation, whatever their goals, who are seeking the ability to make massive uh, effect, uh, human, economic, political, uh, that would come from any kind of a nuclear terrorism attack. Um, so that is constant, if not growing. Uh, the other term is the, the capability, and there the, the spread of technology, the spread of knowledge uh, also means that terrorist capability will continue to grow. The only term in this equation that states have control over is the opportunity. It is the material. If you don't have the material, you don't have nuclear terrorism. That's something I, a phrase I learned from Graham, and uh, it's, it couldn't be more true. And so that's where we, that's the place where we can operate on the potential for nuclear terrorism. And, but also recognizing that the threat will persist. It will shift, uh, it will morph, um, but it will persist. And so we really need to focus on limiting that, opportuni or that opportunity. And this is where I'd, I wish we had a little bit more consensus, a little bit more uh, buy-in from all of the leaders that this is in fact not only true, but also their particular responsibility is as a leader of their country to protect their people against this, to make hard political decisions, to address it, to um, put resources uh, uh, towards these issues. Um, so that's a kind of the base case. And, and while we won't be 100% there in 2016, uh, I, 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 we have made progress and I'm confident we'll continue to make progress. The other piece that we are looking at is how do we really strengthen this architecture? How do we, if in fact 2016 turns out to be the last summit, how do we leave this network of institutions and treaties and missions and capabilities better suited to carry forward the nuclear security mission in all of its diversity? Um, this is not something that can simply be handed over to the International Atomic Energy Agency and leaders walk away and say this is a technocratic problem and now it's all done. We have mission space in the, in the United Nations through treaties and the Security Council resolution 1540 that govern these issues. We have Interpol and the work that it does to combat rad nuke terrorism and illicit trafficking. You have the informal structures such as the global partnership to, uh, against the spread of weapons and materials of mass destruction that was originated by the G8 and now has 25 countries. And that provides a kind of a donor recipient matching community <coughs> to put resources against the solution set. You have the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism that was launched by the US and Russia to, for, each country, for countries who are part of it, 81 countries or more these days, can come together and talk about best practices. That's not an assistance context. It's a way for everybody to do a little bit better uh, within their own resources. Um, so there's a, a myriad of vehicles that need to be polished, enhanced, uh, elevated. And I think we've done a lot of that over the next few years. But what would really, over the last few years, what I would, 
we really want to find is a core group of countries who will commit to acting in all of those institutions in their roles as member states or as founding members or whatever to elevate the capability of those of those that network uh, of the architecture. Um, so we'll we'll be focusing on that alongside all of the usual, you know, deliverables and house gifts and such. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to invite members of the audience who are interested to. Uh, line up behind the two microphones here to uh, ask questions of our panelists. Let me remind you that uh, all of the questioners should start by identifying themselves. And uh, please, no speeches. Uh, uh, ask a question, and a question means that it uh, ends with a question mark. Yes, you're first. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name's Jacob. I'm a freshman at the college and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Uh, my question is, uh, Iran's a very notable country that is currently not scheduled to attend the 2014 summit. Is there a definitive answer as to why this country is not going to be attending the summit, given that they have pursued um, nuclear weapons and have expressed a desire to produce them? It's a pretty simple answer. They've never been invited to attend the summit. Um, the, as we, uh, Gary and I sat together in, in the fall of 2009 and thought about how do we operationalize the president's pledge? Um, he, his point was that the disarmament mission and the nonproliferation missions, which you hint at in your Iran example, have many forums in which those are dealt with by heads of state, key ambassadors, and so on. But the issue of how do you protect nuclear security had no natural home for a head of state conversation. And so what we wanted, and the, none of the existing structures were good platforms for that home. And so what we tried to do is to create a set of countries that would be a constructive conversation and yet quite diverse. If you look at the people who are part of the countries who are part of that first summit and now have been continuing uh, with the other hosts, it's a, it's a diverse range of regions of status vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons, of status vis-a-vis -vis nuclear energy, of attitudes on international cooperation. Um, and so the thought was the diversity would create some power where those countries could come together in consensus, but that would be especially meaningful. It was never understood that Iran would be a constructive part of that conversation, and so they were not invited to the first one, and subsequent hosts have not invited them to the part, to subsequent ones. Maybe we can hope, uh, Gary as the Iran whisperer around <laughs> here, um, maybe they can become uh, worthy of being considered constructive over time, but that's the, the short answer. But I do think, the summit process has been amazing in getting this very diverse group of countries together to actually work collectively on a common problem. They have Arab leaders and Israeli leaders. They have the Indians and the Pakistanis, you know, sitting down together and working on a common problem and not spending all their time attacking each other. It's really been uh, quite a uh, remarkable process, but it hasn't been universal. And there have been, you know, the countries who weren't invited have complained. Um, and that's one reason why the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is open to all member states, uh, is so important. And the, the IAEA had a meeting uh, this past summer that brought together, uh, I think it was something like 130 uh, countries uh, to talk about nuclear security. And even a few years ago, Many of the IEA member states were saying, oh, that's not what the IEA is about. They shouldn't be doing nuclear security. Well, here you had 130 countries endorsing the IEA's role in nuclear security and pushing it forward. So I, I think they have succeeded in a way in transforming the global conversation about nuclear security. Well, and I do want to highlight the point about India and Pakistan because that was very purposeful as we wanted to create a forum in, we, in which we could have a conversation with them about security of materials without having a blame game about how the materials came to exist in the first place. So there was never a question that we would invite Israel, India, Pakistan uh, to, the, to the conversation. And they've, in fact, been among the more constructive players. Um, um, I should ask Samantha, do you want to comment on membership and participation in the summit? Laura is right. Iran is obviously being dealt with on a separate track, and as it should, that the issues are so different than nuclear security. However, um, just because you're not part of the summit doesn't mean that, as a responsible state with dangerous material, you shouldn't be taking the kinds of steps that are being committed to in the context of the summit. Iran could certainly invite an IEA peer review or publish its regulations online. Uh, do things to make us feel more confident that it is securing its materials. Um, 
So, and that's the case for other countries who are not part of the summit. I should make clear sure that Iran has only a teeny tiny amount of uh, highly enriched uranium on its soil at the moment. The only highly enriched uranium it has is some spent research reactor fuel provided by the United States long before the Iranian Revolution and just under a kilogram provided by China at another research reactor that's still in the core uh, of that research reactor. So they, they have not produced the kind of yet themselves yet the kind of material that could be used in nuclear weapons. Yes? Um, you've been talking a lot about dealing, you know, these countries are getting rid of their, what, their nuclear materials, but I'm curious as to what you mean by that. Um, they're not exchanged easily. You can't just terminate a nuclear you know, piece of material. So um, I'm assuming that these goods, this enriched uranium, is actually just going to the U.S. to be used, in which case isn't that kind of a manipulative problem, the U.S. being involved in other people's business a little bit too much? And tell us who you are, please. I'm Zoe. I'm a sophomore at the college. Thanks, Zoe. So first of all, most of the material that we're talking about were being removed was material that the U.S. Uh, sold to these countries years ago for peaceful purposes uh, for work. So we, we created it, and we have an ongoing legal responsibility to make sure that it is effectively secured wherever it may sit. In many cases, countries are shifting away. And in fact, there's a global effort to shift away from using dangerous materials to do peaceful research. And so these countries don't have the ability to dispose of this material properly. And so for us to come in and remove it for them, bring it back to the US, and you said use, we don't use it. We dispose of it. We get rid of it. We blend it down, uh, and, and it's not available for our weapons program or any other uh, use that is other than, other than peaceful. That's a, critical, that's a key component of the understanding that we have. So we're actually taking a big burden off of these countries uh, because they don't have to continue to secure the facilities uh, where it sits. And it, a large chunk of it also is, uh, was supplied originally by Russia, and most of that material is being sent uh, back to Russia, except in a few cases, material is mostly going back to the country that supplied it in the first place. There are a few cases where that's not the case. But um, uh, it's really, I would say, all of these countries have joined up and said, we want to do this. We want to get rid of this material. Let's not have this material in our soil. And what we're talking about is really only two kinds of material. It's highly enriched uranium, or it's plutonium that's been separated from spent fuel. We're not talking about all the plutonium that's in spent fuel from power reactors all over the place. It's the plutonium that's been separated from spent fuel and is therefore uh, more usable in a potential nuclear bomb. But Zoe does have a point about some countries who view this nuclear material as part of their national heritage and independence. Matt, you want to just mention? Uh, well, there's been, uh, there's a number of countries the United States would, uh, has been having discussions with, had hopeful uh, uh, beginnings with that we uh, haven't managed to convince to eliminate their material. Belarus is one. They, we, uh, the Obama administration managed to get an agreement signed at the level of the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister to eliminate all the highly enriched uranium in Belarus. Uh, and uh, take some other actions to help them actually with scientific research uh, in the nuclear field in Belarus. But after uh, sanctions over their uh, poor election practices, they uh, uh, put a halt to the further shipments. They had already shipped out, uh, I think if it's, I recall correctly, over 80 kilograms of highly enriched uranium uh, before they put a halt to it. Um, but I remain hopeful that at some point uh, Belarus uh, may still decide to eliminate the last of its materials. South Africa is another case where uh, their basic view has been, why should you worry about our tiny little stockpile of ATU when you're not doing anything about your gigantic stockpile uh, of highly enriched uranium? Uh, which, you know, uh, I, I would argue, uh, because one good thing isn't happening is not an argument why another good thing shouldn't happen. Um, uh, and there are some good things happening about U.S. highly enriched uranium. There's tons of that getting blended down uh, every year. Um, we just celebrated the completion of a, an amazing arrangement with Russia, uh, where Russia was uh, taking uh, highly enriched uranium out of nuclear weapons, dismantling nuclear weapons, taking the highly enriched uranium. The, the components are actually sort of shredded up into little metal shreds, roasted, dissolved, blah, 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 and blended with uh, other kinds of uranium to produce low enriched uranium that is the normal fuel for power plants but can't be used in a nuclear bomb and shipped to the United States. We just finished destroying 20,000 bombs worth 
of Russian highly enriched uranium over the course of the last uh, 20 years. For quite some time, about one out of every 10 light bulbs in the United States was actually being powered by material from a dismantled Russian nuclear bomb. It's quite an, quite an amazing story. Our colleague uh, Tom Neff from down at MIT was the first one to suggest uh, that uh, initiative, which was just completed. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work of this kind still to be done, and it does require convincing countries that it's in their interests to do it. Thank you. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Max. I'm a freshman at the college. The United States faces, obviously, a lot of threats, one that you've talked about tonight, but also things like traditional terrorism and less obvious ones like climate change or extremely high health care costs. Um, and so, in, especially in terms of the amount of political focus and, um, and, and sort of political, political prerogative that we give to the nuclear terrorism issue, where do you think that this threat stacks in terms of, uh, or relative to all the other issues that we face as a country and also as a globe? Good question. Laura, you want to take your <laughs> shot at it? Well, President Obama has made his opinion on this known. He says that nuclear terrorism is th the most challenging threat that we face uh, as a country from a, you know, from a security point of view. I don't think anyone is equipped to put these in ba baskets with health care and climate change and rack, rack and stack them. But certainly within the national security threats, he's put nuclear terrorism at the top of the heap. Um, he's, he's made, put his, his presence where his mouth is in terms of the summits and his personal attendance and stewardship of that mission. But that being, the, even that being said, if I just think about how, how we spend time at the White House on national security issues, of, there's not a lot of meetings that involve the president on, on nuclear security per se. It's the, a lot of the other stuff. The urgent sometimes sucks out the air from the important. Um, and I can tell you right now, they're talking a lot more about Ukraine than they are about nuclear terrorism, even though we're about to have a summit. Um, so I think the inevitable question is, of course, we have to address all of these. The U.S. is a grown-up country. We need to be able to walk and chew gum and, you know, twirl Frisbees all at the same time, and we do. Um, but this is the mission space that we're focusing on here. I would also say um, that if you actually look at the total time and political attention, there is a lot more high-level attention that goes to climate change. There is a lot more high-level attention that goes to health care uh, than there is that goes to nuclear security. I think it's been important to get some more high-level attention focused on nuclear security because it has resulted in really some quite substantial progress uh, over the last several years. Uh, and to be fair, there was, uh, there's been quite a lot of progress over the intervening, the 20 years or so going back to the collapse of the Soviet Union. There really has been uh, a remarkable uh, set of things that have taken place. Uh, Graham Allison was intimately involved, among other things, in getting the nuclear weapons out of Ukraine. Imagine if we still had several hundred nuclear weapons sitting in Ukraine uh, right now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Reg McCain of oh. Learning and Retirement. I'll come back to you, Samantha. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, and. Uh, if I understand the panel correctly, uh, of the nine countries in the world that currently have nuclear weapons, uh, you seem to have indicated to me in your comments that uh, at least eight of them are scheduled to attend the summit in this, later this month. Uh, I would appreciate being cleared up about the exact uh, uh, whether North Korea has been invited and what the situation is there since North, of all the nuclear possessing states, North Korea looks like uh, to many of us the most irresponsible. Why don't I ask Samantha if she wants to take first shot at that and then we'll ask Laura and Max to speak to it. Well, I think it's my understanding that North Korea has not been invited and it's a similar situation to Iran. Um, they're being dealt with on separate tracks. Uh, as Laura noted, you don't get invited to these things unless you're going to be a, you know, a responsible participant and, a, and come to some agreement with your other participants. And it's just that's not going to be the case for North Korea if they come to a summit. Um, can I can I pr quickly go back to the previous? Of course. Question? Yeah. So I, I was going to echo. Um, both what Laura and Matt said, and it's, it's very difficult for politicians to focus their political capital, their time on issues that are not constituent issues. So your average person on the street is not thinking about nuclear terrorism. They're thinking about their job or their health care or their kids' education 
or like me, my student loans that I need to pay off. So, so get so it's very difficult to to get politicians to focus on something that really doesn't get them points back home. And I think there's a, a, a something that's going on right now that uh, shows that this is the case is that there's these two treaties that the U.S. has signed, very very important for global nuclear security. One governs protection of material and the other one governs uh, criminalizing certain nuclear terrorism uh, offenses. And the, the first treaty um, in its original form is very, very narrow. It only applies to material that's been transported internationally. Now, the Bush administration led an effort to amend it so it would cover a broader array of material, material that's in use and storage at set facilities. So it's very, very important that the amendment enters into force. It's not in force because not enough countries have ratified it. And unfortunately, the US, even though it was a, a sponsor of this amendment, has not yet ratified it. And this is, you know, the Obama administration has pushed this and they've committed to, to get this ratified at the summit. And one of the summit goals is to universalize these treaties. Um, and the problem is in Congress. And you would think that you know the, the trouble would be on the House side. No, it's not. The, the House has managed to get their act together and pass the legislation necessary to complete ratification almost unanimously. Somehow the adults in the Senate haven't gotten their act together. And you, you can point to politics. You have two senators squabbling over whether the death penalty should apply to offenses that are being um, codified into federal law. And it's political. And unless uh, their constituents are going to call them up and say, hey, you need to get this passed because it's an embarrassment to the U.S., other countries are using it as an excuse not, not to ratify. It's bad for security at home. It's bad for security globally. And so unless constituents, and I hope there's students there from Iowa and from um, Vermont who would be willing to call up Senator Leahy and Senator Grassley and please tell them to put politics aside for this very important issue. And again, this is an example of, of how something that's not a constituent concern, it, it, it's not gonna get the attention it needs. Let me get back to North Korea because I think it is a, a concern on a lot of people's minds. Um, obviously, they have nuclear weapons, they have some unknown quantity of plutonium, possibly highly enriched uranium uh, as well. My guess, although it's really no more than that, is that it's probably well secured because it's, you know, uh, it's a fascist dictatorship and it's one of the most important things to that state that they've got. Um, but certainly, uh, as more is produced, uh, the risks will increase. If that regime were to collapse, the risks would increase. There's at least the potential for uh, transfer to other countries. Um, so uh, I think there's, uh, we need to keep an eye on North Korea in the nuclear security broader conversation uh, as well. In the 2012 summit, uh, the South Koreans hosted that summit and actually said to the North Koreans, we'll invite you if you'll uh, you know, recommit to uh, the, your denuclearization commitments. And the North Koreans said, thanks, but no thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, David Wiley. Uh, drone war, war, drone uh, war, warfare and uh, NSA surveillance and the illegal detaining of, of uh, suspects are all primarily based upon uh, the fear and the concern about terrorism. And it seems to me that the president has, has, has never really leveled with the people uh, about that, and uh, most of the criticism of that doesn't talk about terrorism. And, if, and on the political left in the United States, I think largely because of the grounds, the mistaken grounds, illegal, the false grounds upon which he started the Bush started the Iraq War, uh, the concept of a war and terrorism is very unpopular and unbelieved on the political left. So my question is. Uh, is the president fearful of causing panic among the American people uh, by talking more forcefully and, and about the danger of terrorism? And uh, what should American people do to make it more politically feasible for the president to deal with terrorism uh, up front? Well, it's a little hard for Laura to read the president's mind, but uh, when she responds, I'd also like her to address the question of whether 
our success against al-Qaeda and similar groups, whether she thinks that has helped to reduce the threat of nuclear terrorism. Well, as Gary says, I'm not privileged to read the president's mind. Um, but I do think that, for, in fact, for some of the reasons that Samantha mentioned in terms of creating a voting constituency in favor of wise moves to prevent nuclear terrorism, not only in the US but globally, um, we, we could use a little bit more public awareness of the risks of nuclear terrorism, but also the, the solution sets. The solution set to nuclear terrorism is to lock down and eliminate material. That's not controversial. That doesn't require zone, drones. That doesn't require surveillance. So, and I, those are not issues I work on, and I'm not in a position to speak to them. But the mission space for securing nuclear material is pretty well understood. It's not necessarily controversial, and certainly not within the U.S. polity. And so, this is to to educate con uh, our fellow citizens, which is why I come and I do forums like this about the reality of the threat about the, the logic and achievability of the solution, I think is part of making the, the American public both more aware, but not panicked, uh, rather supportive of the solution sets that we need to take as a country and that we need to help other countries take and set a good example for them in our own behavior, which is why um, I really uh, am grateful for, to Samantha for highlighting this challenge with these two nuclear security treaties. It doesn't get more motherhood and apple pie than, than that, and uh, to really be able to play our appropriate leadership role on the world stage as engaging and, and supporting and strengthening the multilateral institutions on which our, new, our own national security depends, I think, is really important. Now, as I, uh, in terms of the progress we may or may not have made against Al-Qaeda, I think it's fairly well understood that Al-Qaeda core is, is less strong, but there's baby Al-Qaeda's or Al-Qaeda affiliates or whatever you want to call them that are springing up elsewhere. This is always going to be true, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's you know, violent extremism of some other uh, ilk. We are going to have uh, parts of humanity who wish to do major ill to other parts of humanity. And nuclear terrorism is always going to be one of the things that they might aspire to. And as the technology progresses, as information becomes more available, um, as the knowledge and capability of the individuals involved in these terrorist uh, cells or violent extremism become more capable, the, the only way we can really manage this issue is to reduce and secure the material that, that does exist. And so that's the, the persistence of the threat is the thing that really compels me in this mission space. Let me just mention one aspect of it that uh, we don't really have a terrific answer to. And that is the question of what's sometimes called security culture. You can have all of the fences, all of the alarms, all the intrusion detectors that you want, but if the people aren't paying attention, you're still gonna have a problem. So we saw that here in the United States in 2012. We had an 82-year-old nun wander through uh, not wander through, cut her way through. Very deliberate. Very <laughs> deliberately. Uh, four layers of fences, three of them alarmed, going right up to the wall of a building holding thousands of bombs worth of weapon-grade, highly enriched uranium metal uh, with two uh, other protester colleagues. They were pounding on the, on the wall. They were spraying blood on the wall. They were painting on it. They were singing songs. Uh, and they were there for quite some time before they were finally accosted by one guard. Um, and it, you know, there were, turned out there were multiple layers of failures basically attributable to poor security culture. And this happens in a country that probably has uh, the most stringent, or at least some of the most stringent security rules in the world, probably the highest spending uh, in the world. Um, if you go to that particular site, for example, they have an armored personnel carrier with a machine gun that fires 3,000 armored piercing rounds a minute um, but you can still have a problem if your people aren't paying attention. And that's not just a problem in the United States. It's a problem around the world. Uh, and we, we really need better ways to figure out how do you keep people motivated? How do you keep people on the alert when at their particular site probably an attack will never happen in their whole career? It's really a tough problem. But, you know, years ago I was talking to the guy who had until a couple years before this been the security czar at the Department of Energy. And he said to me, good security is 20% equipment and 80% culture. Uh, so that's a, that's a big piece that we still need to work on. Dominic, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Dominic Contreras. I work here at the uh, Belfer Center. 
Um, Gary, as you mentioned, uh, Pres President Obama announced that in 2016, Washington's going to host the uh, next nuclear security summit, but for the time being, that's the last one that's planned. I was wondering if you all could speak to uh, post-2016 goals. Uh, Laura, as you mentioned, uh, so long as nuclear material exists, the threat of nuclear terrorism exists. Um, so what can we expect after 2016? Will the summit process continue? Will the political and international will for it? Um, still be there, or what can we expect afterwards? All right, it's a question that requires some speculation. Why don't I start with Samantha? We'll just uh, make it short, please. We don't have too okay. much time left. Uh, well, this goes directly back to what I was saying about the lack of a, a global system right now that to secure all of this material. And uh, there's a, two years between this upcoming summit and the 2016 summit, which is possibly going to be the final summit. That's a two-year window of opportunity to put that system in place so that when the summits uh, co are completed, there's something in place out there to take its place, to maintain the level of attention needed on this problem, um, and a system that's going to still attract um, the commitments necessary and, and have, have find ways for countries to build confidence in others that they're doing the correct thing and follow international standards. So what we're looking to is getting that system in place as, as much as possible before that window closes, because if it closes and this work is, is not done, that's going to be a problem, because there's no, but no institution right now to pick up the flag when that happens. Matt? Well, uh, I would point people again to our uh, website. There is a paper from me at, uh, from the IEA uh, last summer that outlines a bunch of potential fora that you could use. I don't think it's going to be any one forum. I think the IEA will play a very important role, but they're focused only on civilian material, which is about 15% of the world's uh, total. I think that some of these uh, sort of voluntary collectives uh, the global partnership that uh, Laura mentioned, the global initiative that Laura mentioned, probably have, have roles to play. But we, we still need a good bit of thinking about uh, exactly how to do this. One thing that I think ought to be done in the safety world, uh, we have a mechanism where countries write reports about, here's what we've done on nuclear safety over the previous two years, and then there are meetings where everybody can review them. We don't have a treaty that says you have to do that in the nuclear security world, but we could have meetings where states volunteered to do that uh, and, and began having that kind of uh, detailed conversation that we have in the safety world. Another thing that's a gap, uh, in my view, in the, and that it gets to this issue of how do we build the consensus that there's a threat is in the safety world, we have sharing of incidents, and you know this is what happened, this is what you can do to prevent that from happening at your place. We have nothing like that in the security world. We need to start building that kind of experience up. In this progress report we'll be publishing shortly, we have a number of, of recent incidents uh, described and some of the lessons learned as a sort of beginning taste of what needs to be done. Laura. Well, I'm actually going to put the challenge back on this community and really reflect on you know, how special it is to be here both with the Belfer Center but also with NTI and talk about how the non-government world contributes incredibly valuably to the work of governments. Uh, and as we conceptualize, particularly, I mean, I won't be in government when the whatever summit happens in, in beyond 2016. That's, uh, I'm, I hope not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> after five years, it's, um, you know, uh, there, there's a lot that's gone on. Anyway, the, the point is that the, you know, dating back to, to you know, my days here at the Belfer Center, we were inventing what became the Nunn-Luger program, the, the work under the Soviet nuclear fission and cooperative denuclearization, which in my view is just the, the epitome of how the academy can engage effectively in public policy outcomes. And to have that, the intellectual wherewithal of how we can deal with the post-Soviet nuclear and bi you know, nuclear biological and chemical threat available to the politicians in the form of Senator Nunn and Senator Luger who had the recognized the moment that they could take action on that. I mean, that's, that is just incredibly valuable and it's, it turned out to have given me an entire career path. So I'm <laughs> particularly um, pleased to, to have had that happen. But NTI also in terms of the, hopefully you heard a little bit of commonality in, in the way Samantha talks about the future of the architecture and the way I talk about the future of the architecture. We've leaned in incredibly 
uh, much on the intellectual work of NTI. The Nuclear Security Index, I think, has created a very interesting conversation around the nuclear security issue, even though it's very important that it be understood as not a US government product. It, it brings the conversation together. It gives a way to enter the, the issue. And um, it's interesting, some countries are really promoting how they've improved in, in the uh, index as a part of how they engage in the summit process. So I just really want to highlight that one of the keys to what happens after 2016 is the intellectual energy that is here at Harvard, is up at NTI, and throughout the, the, the community outside government that, that is most of you today and, and may continue to be some of you over time. Laura, thanks for that endorsement. I hope that inspires some of you to uh, work in this field. Um, I think last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me the chance to ask the question. I'm a student from McGill University in Canada. Um, how would you comment on the nucle nuclear security situation in China? Do you think China is contributing to the world's nuclear security or the other way around? Since China has been showing some efforts to stop nu North, Co uh, North Korea from using nuclear weapons. Thank you. Very Thank good you. question. Just so happens that we have a reporter on exactly that <laughs> issue. So I'm going to let Matt go first and then Samantha and we'll end with uh, Laura. So I think uh, nuclear security in China is uh, doing quite well. They have made significant improvements over the course of the last, uh, especially since 2008. Um, and uh, they have a fairly modest nuclear stockpile. Uh, they, uh, I hate to be unpatriotic, but they have, I think, a more sensible approach to nuclear weapons than my country does. So they have a relatively modest stockpile, which is not on alert all the time and so on. Um, uh, and uh, there's still more things to be done. They have uh, their nuclear regulatory agency is nowhere near the sort of level of strength and capability of the US uh, nuclear regulatory agency. And they have a very rapidly expanding uh, civil nuclear infrastructure. Uh, they are considering moving into uh, reprocessing of plutonium from spent fuel. I personally think that there, that would be a mistake to rush into. Uh, maybe someday uh, they might go in that direction, but for the moment, there's plenty of uranium, there's plenty of places to store spent fuel. There's absolutely no need for China to rush in the direction of processing lots of plutonium that's weapons usable, shipping it from place to place, uh, and so on. Other countries have already made that mistake, and suffered for it uh, in Britain, for example. It destroyed the company that built the plant, which is now bankrupt. Um, uh, so uh, my recommendation to China, which I've been making fairly energetically for several years, has been to put that uh, on the back burner for the time being. Thank you. Samantha? Yeah. So I mean, luckily for me, I have the index report right in front of me. But uh, <laughs> so China does, you know, it does quite well. It does quite well in the actual security measures that we look at in the report. Um, as I mentioned, we, we do look at five broad areas. So it's not just looking at the actual security measures they have in place. We also look at things like corruption and political uh, instability. So you can imagine that that category brings them down a little bit. Um, and again, their, their quantities are quite high, so that brings them down. But we, we get the sense that they are taking the threat seriously, they take their obligations seriously. There's certain areas um, where they can do better, for instance, in personnel vetting, which is uh, something that's very important uh, to uh, mitigate the insider threat. And that's, that's the risk that insiders who are, are already authorized to be inside sensitive facilities because of their job could somehow be bribed or for whatever reason would aid an outsider in stealing material. And so they have several areas in that grouping of, of security measures that need to be improved. And they're also a little bit of a, you know, closed off, you know, trust us, we're going to do our thing. Um, so we would want to see more confidence building measures from, from China about what they're doing. I would say in our report say that's our coming out, I don't want to yeah. steal its thunder, but the, the two most important recommendations I would say are, one, they have, they don't have a national standard for how secure everything that should be. Each site sort of develops its own approach that's then approved by the regulator. And we recommend that there should be a national, what's called the design basis threat, the set of threats you're supposed to design against. 
And then secondly, that they should carry out realistic performance testing uh, uh, where people sort of pretend to be terrorists trying to break in and, and you see if the security system can really cope with a, a creative, uh, determined set of adversaries trying to overcome it. Okay, Laura, last word to you on China and any other concluding thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I don't have much to add to what um, Matt and Samantha have said about China. In the, in the Security Summit negotiating process, they've been a quiet but generally constructive player. Um, I think they appreciate the credit that they have been um, afforded for the center of excellence that they have launched uh, with the cooperation of the U.S. and several other countries to help Im improve the training and research and development around the nuclear security mission space. Um, I think that the, the real challenge with China is, is somewhat is what the others two mentioned is in the transparency and the visibility of exactly what's going on, not, not only within the civilian nuclear materials arena, which, as Matt pointed out, does not yet include any of the relevant highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Um, and then the, there's the weapons side of the conversation, and that's an area where we've had zero luck uh, in engaging even very quiet, very low-key conversations on nuclear security exchanges. We have those kinds of exchanges with almost every other weapon state uh, th in, that exists, but we, we don't have it with China. And I, from a bilateral point of view, separate perhaps from the summit mission space, I'd really like to see uh, a way to have that conversation enhanced. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. If you're interested uh, in the subject, I encourage you to look at the Belfer Center as well as the NTI website. And uh, uh, many of us will be actually um, on the margins of the summit at the end of this month, so we will be bringing back tales of what happened there. And now, if you stay tuned, I'm sure we'll have some public events that you'll be invited to. Uh, we'll talk about uh, and we'll uh, what was done. And we'll have plenty of material about it on the website. And there'll be a lot on the website. So <laughs> thank all of you, and would you please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.